Welcome to the Damcasters, brought to you in association with the Pima Air and Space Museum. I'm your host, Matt Bowen. The Lockheed SR-71 is probably one of the most recognisable aircraft in aviation history. It's up there with Concorde and Spitfire as an aircraft that almost anybody can pick out. Over the course of the last 35 years, author Paul Crickmore has been granted some remarkable access. I mean, this guy got to sit down and chat with Ben Rich about what was going on at Skunk Works. And all of that has made it into his books on the Lockheed Blackbird family. The latest of which is Lockheed Blackbird Beyond the Secret Missions, The Missing Chapters. And this book is absolutely stunning. It weighs a ton. And it is also Paul's last foray into the story of the Blackbird. So it was great to be able to sit down with him and reminisce about his time researching the aircraft and meeting the incredible men and women who kept it flying for all those years. So without further ado, let's get chatting with Paul about the Blackbird. You say you fell into this. How does a 35-year rabbit hole begin, sir? <laughs> well, um, it began with my love for aviation, of course, which goes right back to when I was in the Air Training Corps as a, a young teenager. And it just continued from there. Um, uh, I saw 972 when it landed at Farnborough in 1974, and that was it, you know, hooked hook, line and sinker, as they say, <laughs> uh, just to see that aeroplane and, and, you know, understand that it just flew across the Atlantic from New York to London in one hour and 55 minutes. I wanted to know more about it, you know, who wouldn't? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it's black and it looks, you know, sinister. Uh, at the same time, it looks beautiful. Um, uh, it, it's just quite, uh, it's an enigma, I guess, in many respects. Uh, I wanted to find out more, and there wasn't very much that you could find out about it. So, you know, um, sort of started digging, and uh, that's that's kind of what happened. I was lucky when I was uh, working in, uh, at London ATC in those days at West Drayton. Um, I was able to get up. I did actually visit West Drayton once. I oh, did, you? Yeah. You know, yes. Funny old place. <laughs> mm. Never went it had down a distinct to smell. That's what I can remember. It... Yes, yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah, yeah and there's uh, orange scopes and all of that mm. good stuff in back in the day. But uh, uh, that allowed me uh, really um, um, an opportunity to get involved in flying on orientation flights. End quote. And uh, consequently, I had jollies in all sorts of fast jets in the RAF and also with the US Air Force and quite a few air refueling uh, KC-135 tanking trips and going taxiing back to the hard stand uh, after one of them back in uh, probably September 1981, passed an SR-71, you know, that hadn't long started operating out of Mildenhall and... Uh, my escort officer was there to, to meet me when I jumped off the last step of the KC-135 and he wanted to know how it went. I said, yeah, I think I've got some good shots of some F-15s, uh, which we refueled over Germany. Uh, and I said, but what's the chances of getting on a air refueling sortie of that that one over there? <laughs> and <laughs> he, that was you know, quite something different. Anyway, a long story short, um, I got a phone call one evening. I recognized his voice. It was an open phone line in those days. It all sounds very James Bond, doesn't it? And uh, uh, he said, can you get to Milton Hall main gate tomorrow at six? And I, it was purely luck. It was a, a day off. So I said, y yes. I said, can I bring my camera? And he said, yes. And then he put the phone down. Uh, and, uh, and that was that. So uh, uh, off I went um, to Milden Hall and uh, boarded a, a KC-135Q tanker. And uh, we set off um, looking at the navigator's map up in the, the, the flight deck. Um, it was generously stamped top secret all over it. And of course, now we can talk about this. You know, we went up into the Arctic Circle in the Viking North Air refueling track off Bodo. And, mm. uh, you know... We, I, I know Bodo well. Uh-huh, yeah. Well, uh, of course, several airplanes, as the program 
went on had to divert into that very mm. that very base for all sorts of technical reasons. But anyway, we were uh, over the sea. Nothing external was particularly was classified about the aeroplane, so I was able to take lots of photos. The weather was perfect, even though it was October, uh, way up there. Orientation of the track was great, illuminating the aeroplane brilliantly. You know, I mean, a fool could have taken the photographs. That I was just, <laughs> I was just lucky. I was in the right place at the right time, and got back on watch. And my dear friend Kev Gothard um, said, "You want to get these published?" You know, and uh, anyway, um, eventually, I sort of pulled my finger out and sent them off to uh, Air Enthusiast. They published the photographs four or five of them anyway and asked if I wanted to write an article about uh, the aeroplane and I thought well I've never written an article before but you know I'll have a go uh, I, I, I knew what and where the red lines were so uh, despite that I sent it off to the deck commander and it came back with only two or three sentences deleted and anyway they ran the article in two, in two uh, sections uh, and then Dennis Baldry from Osprey, uh, the Dennis Baldry, um, r- wonderful, uh, great, great guy, got in touch with me and said, you seem to know a lot about this aeroplane. No one's actually written a, a proper book about it. Um, do you fancy writing a book? <laughs> I said, in my stupidity or, I don't know, supreme arrogance or whatever, I don't know what it was, possessed me really, but I said, well, yes, why not, you know, it's an opportunity. And that was that. Um, I went over to Lockheed, to the Skunk Works. I spent a week there, three days with Ben Rich, which was absolutely incredible a, a wonderful wonderful man he really really was um so bright obviously but so engaging and so down to earth you know he's a lovely guy and uh, they wheeled several test pilots in for me that uh, to interview that were also in, uh, involved in the the early days of the sr program and dan zuck who designed the cockpit and uh, all sorts of... It was just amazing. Then I went on to Beale, and uh, uh, they made available to me, the first uh, SRS made available to me their scrapbooks. So obviously it was all stuff that's public domain, but it was all in one Mm -hmm. place. So, you know, so that was great. I was able to pull all bits and pieces up uh, together from that. And anyway, uh, yeah, that was... um, That was the book that uh, hit the market in, I think, 1986. And... But of course, you know, as the years went by, uh, more information became declassified, uh, particularly after the program was cancelled. And, and that's uh, that's what's kept these last books coming off the line, so to speak, as more and more information has become declassified. Do you think there's more to come or is it a case of operational stuff that's still classified? Do we know everything about um, everything we can know about the aircraft by now um well there's nothing more to come from me much to the delight of my <laughs> long-suffering <laughs> darling wife ali <laughs> i've said that and that's my postman it. i'm gonna yeah. reach over and, and bring it oh goodness it's um <laughs> yeah it's um it's a, it, it's a weighty tome shall we say paul a <laughs> <laughs> it yeah, great doorstop <laughs> but uh yeah that i know that there's a lot of classified information that still about missions really that the u.s air force has and <clears throat> it's just getting around to putting in freedom of information acts to get it released but it's all at maxwell air force base so if anyone out there would like to carry on the baton where i've now left off and continue with you know mapping out the legacy of that amazing program and those incredible people that serviced the aeroplane flew the aeroplane used the intelligence that that aeroplane generated then you know please you know it would be great to um to read some more about that uh about senior crown as it was called we need to sort of break this down into a bit of a potted history about the aircraft and then the mm. section on maintainers which i found absolutely fascinating that's sort of going to be the the, the breadth of this but as i have you mm. And as we talked about this on the phone the other day, you have to tell me some Ben Rich stories. And I suppose we have to say for those who may not have heard of him, 
who was he? Because he was a bit of a boy when it comes to wielding a pencil that becomes incredible airplanes, doesn't he? Yes. Well, uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, he was a thermodynamicist. Uh, He was Kelly Johnson's protege. And when Kelly became ill, uh, Ben took over. And um, he went on to become um, really the father of stealth. The have blue and uh, the platform that um, sort of um, checked out uh, the sort of stealth technologies that were then embedded into the F one one seven. That uh, F yeah uh, that that was all that was all really down to to him and his team at the Skunk Works. So a remarkable man. You got to spend a good few hours with him. What was he like as a as a person talking about the things he was allowed to talk about, even though he he did allude to some of the things he, he should, probably shouldn't have. Didn't well, he? you know that, that. I mean, as I say, he was quite a character. I mean, I went into uh, his office, um, shook hands, and sat down the usual pleasantries, and then straight off the cuff, he said, "Okay, Paul, so." Uh, you've probably heard that we're building, um, uh, I've probably heard rumours about we're building a very special aeroplane called a stealth aircraft. Well, I'll tell you here and now that uh, those rumours are absolutely true. <laughs> that was at a time, I was completely unsolicited, you know. My jaw must have just swung open. Because, wow, you know, it's in- incredible. Um, but it, it was interesting, though. He then went on to say, yeah, that there's been a heck of a lot of speculation but on this I will say those that know don't say and those that say don't know and I well remember and I'm sure you do too Matt that um, plastic model made by the tester corporation of the F117 and of course you look at what the ones one seven actually looked like compared to the tester model and you know poles apart you know so he was absolutely right wherever tester got their information from uh, it was certainly from no one that had anything to do with with that uh, that program because i remember micropose made a flight early flight simulator f19 stealth fighter that was of that tester kit Mm -hmm. that when the the 117 was finally declassified. They basically just retconned the packaging <laughs> and put a different picture on it because it was sort of all sat inside, so you didn't really see out. So the, the, the two games are, are essentially the same, but um, you know, about a few years... Because it, it was only... Oh, goodness, because that would have been late 80s because then yes. everything became very public 1991, didn't oh, it? Oh, well, that. Golf, mm. Golf War, yeah. But, I mean, it's interesting because when Kelly Johnson got involved with the uh, building a replacement for the U-2 because the U-2 was being tracked by Soviet radar. That really wasn't what Eisenhower wanted at all. Um, and so the challenge was make U-2 stealthy, you know, in, invisible to radar. So they sort of called it radar camouflaging. Um, and um, Project Rainbow, as it was called, and so they, they, they tried to yeah, make it stealthy. It didn't work. Uh, and so we had Project Gusto, which was, right, we're now going to build a replacement. Convair got involved uh, as well, and they f- uh, they furnished uh, some designs. Lockheed were declared um, the winner in August of 59, and the project then became Oxcart. And, of course, that was the forerunner of the SR-71, as we know. But whilst Kelly was drawing out A1, A2, A3, A4, up to A12, Archangel being the A standing for. Uh, he, initially, he, 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 it was, they didn't have the computer capacity to actually forecast how um, an incident radar wave would react when it hit an aeroplane. Um, particularly nothing like you know that they, they did later on with the F117 when that was around. They had computers with good processing power, and more importantly, they had um, computers and processors that were able to work incredibly fast, and therefore you were able to build an aeroplane that was completely unstable but could be made stable because of the computers. And that's why, you know, you've got this merging of technologies at the right time. And 
you know, the blended body concept, and everything, as you look at the SR71 today, and you can see certainly elements are, you know, there. And the materials um, along the wing fillets, uh, you know, um, sandwiched with hypoxy and asbestos uh, to you know, soak up radar and not transmit the, the a return signal. Um, the fins canted in at 15 degrees uh, to help knock out right angle, you know, triangles. You don't, you don't want that. So there are a lot of elements that you see when you look at the SR-71, that it was certainly going in the right direction. But, uh, you know. I guess what we term a, a, a clean piece of paper design, because the U-2 had a lot of sort of bits, wasn't it? It was, was it F-104 body to, to a degree and things, whereas yeah. this couldn't be, just due to the nature of what it was required to do. What, what yeah. I suppose, let's ask the basic question. Where did the the spec for it come from? What Was it a... Air Force spec, or was it definitely a, a CIA intelligence request for an aircraft to be this fast and this exotic? Yeah, or to yeah. end up to be this fast and this exotic? Yeah, it, it was. It, it was, you know, it was generated initially by the CIA as a replacement to the U two. The U two was being operated by the CIA um, civilians in quotes uh, to overfly the Soviet Union. That's what it was to do. Um, they realized that it had a limited shelf life and start and embarked upon, you know, the, the replacement of, of this airplane and altitude, heart, extreme altitude and speed really was um, uh, at the, the heart of vehicle survivability because you had, um, I think it was a 10 second time window for the SAM crew to actually use the fan song radar to lock on fire the missile the missile to get up to the right altitude and in the right pocket of airspace that would meet this aeroplane 15 miles high um it was lumping along uh, you know a mile uh, a mile and a half every two seconds so you know it, that's what made it survivable really i mean when the airplane when the uh, the air force uh, started using it over Vietnam. Um, it had no radar warning for an airborne threat because, you know, when it flew it, its first sortie in uh, March of 68, there was nothing up there that could get it, so it didn't need it, you know. And uh, and when they did finally put a roar on for uh, air-to-air radars to receive air-to-air radars uh, as a threat alert, um, it was only to the front of the aeroplane because, again, you know, in a tail chase, well, you couldn't have a tail chase, you know, you could, it, it was impossible. So unless there was an aeroplane in front of you, like, you know, had the ability uh, to, to fire a missile head on, then you know, it was, it just wasn't going to happen. It, it's one of those parts of the spec that always surprises me that even after what had happened to Francis Gary Powers and things, there wouldn't have been that redundancy to have the uh, DCM warning on the aircraft. Because I guess it's, it seems, you know, we're too fast to catch, but then they thought it was too hot. You know, it's just one of those things that as, you know, in my business analyst head, you're like, well, hang on, that would, that surely should be a requirement because it's something we learned over here. But it's just one of those, one of those strange quirks, I suppose, of, of these sorts of designs and these sorts of aircraft. Yeah, that's it. I mean, and you alluded to it too, really, that you couldn't use stuff off the shelf, which they did with the F-117, you know, because as you rightly say, you know, the, the flight envelope was completely different. Um, you know, Kelly often said everything on the SR, or the A-12, YF-12, <laughs> it was built, you know, from scratch, from the ground up. Um, so it was titanium. Uh, and there are all sorts of interesting uh, ways that the design team uh, overcame the challenges of, for instance, how do you anchor some thin titanium skin to the hard sort of substructure of the wing without it tearing because of the differential of expansion between the the two elements and they used a standoff clip um, 
which acted as a heat shield so that uh, you know the, the, the titanium skin didn't expand quickly and just tear against the rivets that were anchoring it to the substructure you know clever uh, you look at the wing go down to Duxford and look at the wing area especially of the airplane and it's corrugated for the same reason you know you have a, a two-dimensional expansion and it will tear rivets and so on however you put a corrugation in it and all of a sudden it becomes a three-dimensional expansion issue and all that happens actually is that the corrugations get deeper so very clever you know in fact you know at one stage kelly um you know said you know people laugh at me and they say i'm trying to make a ford tri motor go mark three <laughs> you know uh, uh, it's, it's just, I, I just love things you know like that the, the whole thing about the air, the special fuel because if you put normal fuel in it it would explode in the tanks because you're going so fast um and of course, then you couldn't light the fuel, so you had to have a chemical ignition system to ignite the fuel. Uh, it, it just goes on, on, and on, and uh, it was just fascinating. Uh, the, the, the hurdles that they had to overcome, uh, you know, right back there in the day, uh, without you know the amazing computer uh, technology that we have available today, and it all worked incredibly well. Yeah, there was. Um, Speed records, you know, as I say, you know, an hour and 55 minutes across the Atlantic. It still stands today. Uh, yeah. It says a lot about the aeroplane. Yes, and it, it's it, it's that problem solving, that sort of logical progression of it, we're going to encounter this, how do we overcome it? Well, it has to be built as titanium, but then you know, all, all of this sort of very logical prob problem solving for something that is incredibly unorthodox mm -hmm. um, by you know a norm normal s sphere of the imagination but you Clearly. you did mention it there's this when we talk about the blackbird it's really a series of aircraft isn't it so we we're very familiar mm -hmm. with the SR71 mm -hmm. but there was also a number of other variants of it as well yeah. so what were the the other ones i suppose is the <laughs> yeah yeah oh, that's a very the, fair the easy question. way to put the question yeah mm. um well the a12 really that was the one that really started the in quotes blackbird ball rolling um and so um the cia uh contracted skunk works to build 12 single seaters and one two seat um aircraft as i say operated by uh, the cia um and of course as you, you alluded to powers were shot down um eisenhower said right th there will be no manned flights reconnaissance gathering flights over the soviet union that's it and that was upheld by other presidents that came along down the line so the question then arose well what the heck are we going to do with this thing you know um and along came the cuban missile crisis another u2 fell victim of the sa2 uh, and by 64 um it demonstrated uh, all of the criteria um altitude speed endurance capability there were 13 airplanes up at area 51 by then uh, four of which were designated to collect strategic reconnaissance from over cuba a program what was called skylark um, but there was a bit of um, disagreement to put it mildly um, between joint chiefs of staff secretary of defense secretary of state and dci mccone and the, the whole thing was kicked out because they thought that actually um it would compromise the overall secrecy of of the program so that didn't happen so eventually a long story short um they believed that surface to surface missiles were being supplied by the soviet union to the north vietnamese um and so that's that's where it it first cut its teeth in the skies over north vietnam trying to gather the strategic um reconnaissance uh, that would prove that these missiles were there, but in the process, we're getting incredible photography back of SAM sites, and the the granularity of the film that the Perkin Elmer Type One camera was using, focusing via an 18-inch lens onto, say, this incredible um, 
negative. You could keep just uh, you know, blowing it up and up and enlarging and enlarging and get uh, amazing detail. I mean, at Nadir, d- directly below the aeroplane, uh, from 80,000 foot, the resolution was a foot. Going out to three to four foot, 35 miles either side of the aeroplane's track. So, you know, it was like an, an, an enormous hoover doing all taking these enormous sways and the photo interpreters were able to drill down and as i say find the sam sites find out which ones were occupied because this was the other thing the north vietnamese played this game there were about six sam sites to every sam battalion and so they would move them around and so those guys that were charged with planning a strike the next day, you know, uh, would have this data which would, you know, give them a pretty good idea actually of which uh, sites were occupied and which weren't. So, you know, but that was a, more of a tactical reconnaissance gathering exercise. And as I say, this is a sort of mission creep, really. So sort of it was doing this and, and quite rightly, um, the uh, military out there you know, really wanted that intelligence, uh, but it was it wasn't what the CIA was kind of sort of contracted to do. It was initially to fly over the Soviet Union and gather strategic reconnaissance. You know, and there, there's there's quite a bit of, of difference. So, I guess it's not altogether surprising that the, the the U.S. Air Force, you know, needed a similar platform because of you know the strategic um, the psyop. Um, in, in a, the case of a nuclear war, uh, you would need an aeroplane like that that would then overfly the Soviet Union, uh, you know, it, as a precursor to Armageddon. Um, so they needed an aeroplane like that. Um, it was more capable because it had uh, high resolution radar that it could carry in the nose. The nose section on the SR was interchangeable. You could put a radar nose on it, or you could have um, a. Uh, a high resolution panoramic camera in the nose so it's very versatile but because of all of this extra kit you needed someone in the back to operate it so it was a reconnaissance systems officer that sat behind the pilot in what was the q bay which on the a12 carried this big old camera so instead you had a guy in there working you know these systems um, and that externally if you like, was the major difference between the two to look at between the A12 and the SR. He had a, an extra an extra body uh, sitting behind the, the pilot. So, so there we had the SR. But of course, there was a, three YF12 fighter variants that were built um, using um, a Hughes Pulse Doppler ASG47 radar, which was incredibly accurate. Again, um, it demonstrated in tests that it could lock on at Mark III at 75,000 foot to a target at 1,500 foot over the sea. And it would have to lock on quick because of the closure speed, obviously, and fire its missile. <clears throat> and uh, Jim Easton, who, again, I met through Ben Rich, um, who was the chief test pilot on the YF-12, said that, on the evaluations, and I think there were five off the top of my head, where they fired dummy missiles um, over the sea at these these targets, they would acquire the target like at extreme range. And by the time the missile had impacted, that then the radar head was like right on its gunnel, you know, it's right looking right down at it because of the closure rate. So, but that was cancelled. Robert McNamara, the Secretary of Defence at the time, said it's very expensive, don't need it. You know, this is the age of missiles um, and kind of going off track a little bit. That's why, you know, the Phantom didn't have a gun. The missile was going to do everything. So what do we need? These incredibly expensive aeroplanes. I mean, uh, they reckon that two wings of these aeroplanes, 96 aeroplanes in total, uh, split 50-50 between the East Coast and the West Coast would have been enough to completely defend uh, continental North America. Quite a thought, but chopped expense. We're going to take a quick break so that we can get the latest from the Pima Air and Space Museum with Head of Collections, Andrew Bowley. 
Here at the Pima Air and Space Museum with our Fairchild A-10 Thunderbolt II, or Warthog. Um, the A-10 was designed specifically as a tank buster ground attack aircraft. Um, it's one of those aircraft that's kind of, has a pretty good story. I mean, people either really love this aircraft because it's kind of unique. I mean, they got a titanium bathtub that the pilot's sitting in to protect him. Got a 30 mil millimeter Gatling gun that fires um, 4,200 rounds per minute, which means they can run out of ammo pretty quickly, short bursts. Um, <clears throat> could carry a slew of different types of weapons. And it's been upgraded over the years. These early A models had really kind of limited um, sensors and targeting equipment. It was kind of really kind of brute force. Um, but over the years, they've upgraded them and made them more adaptable for night combat and fu uh, firing more high-tech weapons. It's an aircraft that, to be fair, the Air Force has often tried to get rid of, um, which is why I think A-10 pilots are kind of a unique breed of pilots because they kind of always feel like they're uh, the ones that the Air Force is, you know, they're not, they're not flying the pointy bass jets and stuff like that. But, you know, in Desert Storm and then again in the Middle East, the A-10 really proved itself. Um, you know, the A-10 was often the aircraft that ground troops would call in specifically when they needed ground support. Sometimes just the A-10 coming in, firing its cannon and quick burst was enough to disperse enemy forces. But, and also here in Tucson, Arizona, we are kind of what they consider the spiritual home for the A-10. Davis Mothin Air Force Base has always been the training base and the big base for A-10s. Um, that has allowed us over the years to you know, foster a lot of good relationships with A-10 pilots. Um, another interesting exhibit we have here is the Bing, which is all the stuff that they brought back from Operation Enduring Freedom in Afghanistan. They essentially had their own little pilots club. Um, so all the patches that they would leave and uh, unit uh, memorabilia was brought back here for us to recreate a kind of display of their officers club. So the A-10 here is kind of the heart of our Arizona aviation exhibit for good reason. To learn more about what is on display and what events are coming up at the Pima Air and Space Museum in Tucson, Arizona, please do check out their website at www.pimaair.org. And now, back to the show. But again, you sort of think about the numbers and you wonder if you're cussing it down to that many aircraft to have that level of defense, surely getting rid of the hundreds of other aircraft might. Mm. Uh, anyways, we're, we're talking yeah. hypothetical. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Mark McNamara was a, a very clever man, um, but had some very interesting I <laughs> yeah, ideas. When yes. it to, yeah, yes. His, his kid geniuses in... in um, in RAND, certainly um, uh -huh. ran some interesting numbers, shall we say? Yes, yeah, they they did, they did. And the up before the other aeroplane, of course, that we must mention, although again, like the YF-12, uh, and there are only two of these that were built, um, was the um, M21 and the D21, and so it was the mother-daughter combination. So you had an A-12 with a second seat in it with a launch control officer on it. And then you had a drone that sat on the back on a pylon. And you had to fly this thing. And again, through Ben, um, I was introduced to and spent um, a whole afternoon talking to Bill Park that, um, that flew these sorties. And it was an incredibly tight profile that they had to fly and had to do a push over and maintain. Um, it was... It was something like four fifths of a negative G. I mean, it's incredibly tight. At Mark 3.12 was what he told me to get the vehicle set to get the separation um, for the drone. Then uh, to go off, <clears throat> it had an inertial navigation system. It would fly around a predetermined area again at Mark 3. Um, tiny radar signature. Um, Kelly was hoping for a resolution of the cameras of about six inches. 
um, anyway. But it it, uh, it really didn't work out. It was it was very very difficult to do. Um, Kelly, I think the, the airplane actually first flew on the twenty second of December sixty four, the same day as the SR seventy one. In fact, and and indeed, it flew from Area fifty one, and the VIPs and the Lockheed guys that went up to see it were late getting back to Palmdale to see the SR seventy one undertake its its first flight. Anyway, that's by the by. But um, <clears throat> on on the fourth flight, when they were launched, actually there was only four occasions when they actually successfully launched this uh, thing off the uh, the mother ship. It collided into the back end and the whole aeroplane completely disintegrated incredibly Bill Park survived um, and Torek actually got out in one piece but he drowned he couldn't inflate his uh, life preserver and um, his uh, space suit, his pressure suit um, filled with water um, this is a horrible, horrible you know, waste uh, after surviving something like that you know, Ben said there was like a, you know, a fifty cent clip that he just couldn't unclip, um, and yeah, and that was the result. But so that that was cancelled on the thirtieth of July, nineteen sixty six. After that accident, and they then started to fly the D twenty ones off of B fifty twos, specially modified a couple of B fifty twos. But again, it, it really wasn't a successful um, program, and and funnily enough. It too got cancelled after the fourth operational flight um, over the People's Republic of China. It, it just really wasn't working out um, getting the reconnaissance package back. There were all sorts of problems and everything else. And by that time, Corona was starting to to get results. So uh, you know, it really wasn't very cost effective. Uh, I think it was 5.5 million in 1970 money that the the program you know cost. And it was the lack of success that, yeah, come the twenty third of July nineteen nineteen seventy one. It you know it was it was chopped. Am I thinking right that the Corona satellite program was also Lockheed? Yeah, they made the rockets. Yeah. Yes, yeah, you're absolutely <laughs> right. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> nothing like having wheels within wheels. Is that anyway. <laughs> diversification? I think they'd call it these days. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I, I I got to see one of the surviving D21s out at Pima, um, ah, well, and yeah. it's it's a fascinating thing. It 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 looks like something out of Stingray, the old mm, yes and, yes um, cartoon, and. It, yeah, it's it is pretty, but it it, it looks very yeah almost cartoonish. It's, I, mm. I keep coming back to those sort of Gary Anderson des- designs for for those those sort of shows, and it was quite something to see. But to think that to launch that off the top of a a, a Blackbird as well, yeah, that, yes, goodness, yeah, must have seemed like a good idea on paper. <laughs> this is it yes yeah it, <clears throat> it, <clears throat> it, excuse me yeah it, it but uh, yeah the practicalities of it all uh, are, yeah. yeah let let's get on to that section of your book that i funnily enough and i saw it in the table of contents i went straight to it because we spend a lot of time talking about operations of aircraft and and the thought that goes into it goodness we've spent a half hour <laughs> Talking, yeah, talking about that but you've got a section in there about the maintainers and, and, <clears throat> and keeping the blackbirds flying and it's interesting as well considering they were in use a lot as well so with only mm. 50 aircraft flying keeping them <clears throat> keeping them going keeping them in the air was quite a trial and i was quite surprised at some of the times between heavy checks and things but mm. where were they being maintained for the for the main part, was it was it in Nevada or was there another another specific um, detail that they were they right. were doing the heavy work? On? Okay, well, well, the A twelves were absolutely up at Area Fifty One. That's where they they everything happened there, apart from Black Shield when they went you know to Kadena to fly against, uh, and then there was a limited amount of maintenance. The idea was that they would be there for a certain period of time and then they would fly back for more deeper maintenance, but that never happened because there's the same three aeroplanes that stayed there for the whole for the the year. I mean the aeroplane only flew 
29 operational sorties in a year before it was chopped. So, you know, we never really got into talking about deep maintenance as far as the A12 was concerned. But as far as the SR was concerned, then, yeah, that's a, that's a different thing. Now, one of the, the things that people, you know, don't, don't quite appreciate is they didn't, there wasn't enough money in the kitty to have them all, you know, up and running every day of the week. And everything. So there would be a, a, a premium or a, authorized airplane so there would only be a certain number so for instance when they were operating at detachment one over in Kadena, detachment four at milton hall and at beale air force base the home base they might have the two seater at beale and maybe two three other aircraft as well there um, at the height of the vietnam war they actually had four sr-71s operating for a brief time out of Kadena, but that went down from to three, and so that it tended to be three for most of its lifetime, although towards the end, the last few years, it went down to two. And we know um, in this country, um, two aeroplanes operating out of Mildenhall. So what are we looking at? So say two, four, probably eight aeroplanes that were financed if you will, to, to operate at one time. And again, the complexity that we were talking about earlier, Matt, on these aeroplanes, um, initially, they would, um, it, it required about 720 man hours per flight hour because of the complexity of the systems. Yeah, that's how, how you know, difficult and you know, how demanding they were to keep, to keep the things up. Uh, that actually was, you know, cut back um, as time went on, and I think they got it down to about 150 hours per flight hour um, as as time went on, and they had different systems that that came in, uh, DAFIX, uh, digital uh, automatic uh, system for the uh, the spikes and all that sort of thing. So, uh, yeah, um, so that was the the one thing, and then uh, when it it went into deep maintenance. I mean, it would take uh, about eight or nine months for an aeroplane to go through that. So they would rip out all the sealant, um, the fuel sealant, because they were wet tanks. So they would rip all that out and it would be resealed. I mean, it, yeah, it was a, a real thorough job um, and expensive. Um, so that that was one major resource and that was conducted the, um, at Palmdale. Um, you also had um, guys out at uh, out in the field, um, U.S. Air Force um, maintenance crews, uh, who were, you know, doing the non-deep maintenance uh, that was going on at Palmdale, and then they brought up a, a, quite an interesting thing that I'd never heard of before: um, uh, the Blue Streak team. And, and they were like uh, specialist uh, troubleshooters that could almost, you, you know, that could do, um, carry out far more um, demanding maintenance actually in the field than regular U.S. Air Force guys. And the first time um, I found out that they actually used the Blue Streak team was uh, in September 1974. Um, when uh, an aeroplane 976 got airborne from Kadena and one of the engines um, hadn't had the keepers put in place um, for the compressor section. One of these blades, um, uh, cat, well they had an engine, uh, had an unstart uh, actually and then that particular engine then caught fire uh, causing quite a bit of fire damage and uh, it was on a functional check flight, so um, J uh, Rosenberg, the pilot, got it down and into Kadena really quickly. And it was the, uh, this specialist team, the Blue Street team, that, that went out and got it to a state where it could be flown back to Palmdale, you know, for the, the thing to be stripped right back. And, uh, you know. and I, I think that's the thing that we need to call out as well, because... 
normally you think of maintenance, you oh, we can you know, engine fire. I I was on shift one time when one of our a, brand new A three twenties shed a com- compressor blade and you shut it down. You put another one on a truck and a couple of days later your airplane's back. <laughs> yeah. the, these these things are really two engines in one, aren't they? Because you mentioned uh-huh. unstart, and I think yes. that's that's an interesting thing to discuss because that's. Uh-huh. Not a phrase you'd hear very often when we talk about a, an aircraft operation. Yeah. Um, so I guess to be accurate, you should call it an aerodynamic disturbance. Um, but unstart is the term that, you know, everyone <laughs> it, it, it has, it has anything to do with the SR-71. Is, is what they call it. Uh, okay. So um, pressure at sea level, 27 pounds a square inch, roughly. Up at 80,000 foot. It's about a quarter of a pound per square inch. Okay, so a jet engine needs air. If you look at the SR-71, it has these spikes that stick out of the nacelle. As the aeroplane accelerates um, above, I think it's Mark 1.2, they unlock and they start going backwards. As they do so, if you can imagine it, they are conical in shape as they go back the surface area of that intake increases so the tube of air that is going into that nacelle is increased by over 100 percent something like 110 percent the capture area has increased however as it that spike retracts even further um, the throat the distance between the, sur- the surface of the spike and the interior surface of the inlet gets smaller. And so you have this constriction. Um, and of course, you know when you put your, f- your thumb over a bicycle pump and you push it and you can feel the heat build up as the pressure builds up. Much the same thing happens in that inlet. So that the pressure in there it, you know, it gets really hot because it has been compressed. And the aeroplane, a lot of people say, how fast can SR-71 go? Well, it had a CIT compressor, compressor inlet temperature red line at 426 degrees centigrade. Okay, so, so it gives, shows you just how hot that air got in that intake, despite the fact that it was about minus 60 degrees Celsius outside of the intake, you know, so... So that was, the, the, and and that's that's a temperature differential in a matter of feet, isn't it? it, it yeah, it, it's, uh, it's, about it's eighteen. Incredibly, about eighteen yeah. foot. Yeah, about eighteen foot. You're absolutely right, Matt. Yeah. So, um, and and the th- the problem is that hot air got exponentially hotter for every one degree over that one twenty six degrees C. So you then started to get incredibly high temperatures at the back end, and that's where you'd start causing a lot of damage, you know, to your, uh, your turbine blades and, and all that sort of thing. So so that's that's that part of it. But now to return to the unstart. So you had this air in inside the intake which was allowed then to expand okay but you had a pressure differential of about 14 pound a square inch inside the inlet compared to a quarter of a pound a square inch outside so basically what was happening is the aeroplane was being sucked and that's well, Ben Rich you know, had he described it to me is actually sucking the intake along and you had various bypass doors to manage the flow of that air throughout the uh, nacelle and engine area which is fine until it it was disturbed in some way and then that pressure recovery in the inlet would be belched out forward of the intake so you'd lose all of that thrust instantly and of course, Kelly Johnson, being the genius that he absolutely was, thought, foresaw that this could could happen, and thought, well, if that happened, it would be game over. The airplane would pitch up, flip over, disintegrate, and that would be it. So, as soon as there was an unstart in one engine, the other one would automatically run the spike forward and purposefully, if you like, unstart. So you didn't have this enormous asymmetric thrust issue um, going on with one engine developing full power and the other one not so that's how they got it but that was the unstart it was where you lost all that pressure recovery in the inlet 
I, it, I hope does that make sense? I it 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 does, and that's you know the the amount of time that all of that would happen as well, especially when you've got an aircraft that's able to accelerate as it does. Mm. You wouldn't have been there would have been no way for a pilot to recover with that asymmetrical thrust as as, as you're no. saying, and no. a, a few were lost due to engine issues, weren't they? Yeah, um, actually, the first SR seventy one that was lost, I met again. Ben Rich at that meeting at Skunkworks, Bill Weaver, and his backseated Jim Sway was the test engineer. Um, they were um, on a, a, a flight in Airplane 9752, uh, and they were putting, they were, as I say, they were Lockheed um, test pilot crew, test crew. They flew with the, um, they were having problems with the aeroplane going out in uh, supersonic. They were using up a vast amount of fuel, that transonic area. And so they flew with the centre of gravity slightly further aft than normal. Uh, and when the centre of pressure moved aft as well, and they were in a slight bank at 75,000 foot at Mark III, uh, boom, they had an unstart. And the thing pitched up and disintegrated. And actually, again, a bit like uh, the case with the MD-21, uh, uh, um, the drone and the drone incident, uh, both guys got out. And what is really weird, uh, and even to this day they're not sure exactly how it happened, is they found the ejector seats in the wreckage. But both guys got out. And they think what happened was when the aeroplane pitched up, the aerodynamic forces on the underside of that fuselage which that long fuselage forebody snapped off they then think there was like a ram air effect literally going through the airplane um oh and as it pitched up the um handles for pulling the canopies off for if there's a problem an emergency on the ground for the uh, fire crew to pull the canopies off they think when it pitched up it ripped what they call that chine which held those handles in place off that blew the canopies off the air going up the back end then blew the guys out and through you know an open canopy space and of course they had the parachute on they had a full space suit so mm -hmm. it inflated to protect them to stop their blood boiling because of Boyle's law and you know pressure depression and all, and all of that and uh, Jim um, Zweier was killed uh, he had a broken neck on the aeroplane disintegration. Um, but um, Bill um, uh, survived. The front you know, pilot survived. Um, but, yeah, th that was a, a, a painful um, lesson in what an unstart can can do. But, of course, as time went on, they, um, they had a, a digital automatic flight inlet control system um, which is a software package that um, Tom Tilden and a couple of others really developed, um, uh, made by Honeywell, and it really cured the unstart problem. Uh, you know, computers c can sense things and react to them so quickly that it, it virtually you know, it was an end of, uh, to to these things, <laughs> this phenomena. And and this is I suppose the other thing, which is probably an obvious thing to say, but We'll call it out, anyways. Mm. It's, um, <laughs> yeah, th this is the first time non-specialist test aircraft are regularly operating in this environment, isn't it? You, you have a number of aircraft operating in a region that before which you're talking about spe specialist sort of NASA aircraft and, and test aircraft that are dabbling. And I suppose possibly the, the only one that could maybe sit in the same sort of category you're talking x15 aren't you it's we're in that sort of rare mm. rarefied space of that altitude that speed and yeah. regularity at it yeah uh, but the big thing i think that even separated again this uh, here i am of course aren't i waving the flag in the sr um, that's but why you're it, here <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> it was sustained this was mm. the big thing you know during the yom kippur war in 73 uh, the plan was to fly um, an SR-71 
they, they moved it f uh, two aeroplanes temporarily to Griffiths Air Force Base from Beale and it would fly the idea was it would fly across the Atlantic uh, through the Straits of Gibraltar into the war zone and then back and recover into Mildenhall the Heath government at the time said no 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 um, we don't want that um, thing landing here uh, we want to kind of stay neutral we want to show our friends uh, that produce oil that we're good people and we want to maintain the flow of oil so no we're not going to allow it and of course that backfired anyway because uh, they chopped uh, the oil supply to us in any event so what happened Poor, poor, poor Ted always tried to play both sides against the I, middle, didn't he? <laughs> absolutely. Yes, you can't please all the people all the time. And uh, so what happened is, um, yeah, they, they flew over the war zone, over Israel, Egypt, Syria, and then back again and landed um, back at Griffiths. So they did it nonstop, you know. I think it was something like um, over five hours at Mark Three. So I mean, you know, you you and and, you know, and of course they were having to slow down. So, uh, I think there were, let me see, one, two, three, four, five, five air refuelings that they would have to you know, slow down, descend, fill up the tanks, accelerate. So incredibly demanding flights, you know, really amazing. And the guys were virtually having to be lifted out of the cockpit, you, you know. Mm. You can imagine kind of, all that time in spacesuits, you know, um, uh, with the, those demands. Um, yeah. And, and there's not really any creature comforts in it as well, is it? There's, you know, they're, they're, they're having to, to make do with, you know, the coals of nature and thing in a very yep. tight space in a yep. spacesuit that they can't yep. undo too much of just in case something goes wrong. Yeah, you wouldn't want. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. They had a, um, a thing, a UCD, a urine collection device, um, which they would pee into. And so that was, uh, um, that was quite funny, actually. A chap that I know, Dave Dempster, um, in the early days of the SR program, it was him and John Story, who was an absolute legend, who was the pilot. They were doing a, a round states flight, and um, and Dempster said, "You know, I've, I've just got to pee. I just, I, you know." And he was absolutely <laughs> bursting, and so Story says, "Well, look, I look at it this way: you can either hold it or you just let it go into your suit." And because this is the earlier, and Dempster hadn't had his pressure suit measured up for his being sorted out by the David Clark Company. You know, they were all tailor made back then. Um, and so, um, story said, by the way, uh, Dave, whose pressure suit are you wearing? Uh, uh, Colonel Doug Nelson. <laughs> and that was all that he needed to make sure he held it until he landed. That was the motivation that was needed, you know, not to pee in the Colonel's pressure suit. <laughs> but you're right, so that was... A, and then, of course, if they needed any kind of sustenance, they had a, um, a, a hole in the side of the helmet uh, with a rubber... Uh, non-return valve so you have this tube and a straw in it that you poke through it and you know you could suck this stuff like apple pie or what all sorts of like uh, in fact it was made by gerber the same people that made the baby food it's the same company <laughs> so you'd have these yeah and you'd be feeding you know on uh on this thing and one pie i can't recall who it was now once told me on one occasion just as he was taking the straw out of the helmet a little bit of food residue pinged up and stuck on his chin and there it had to remain you know until they landed because you know again you, you you know you really didn't want to open your your face visor for the same reason you know as you mentioned you know if you had a, a rapid decompression you know, well you, you know you that was it but yes <laughs> <laughs> I, I i'd always as as someone sort of growing up and you're 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 blown away by flying the technology behind it and things. It's when the realities of these things, like first world war engines being lubricated with castor oil, mm. you know, you suddenly think when you're a little bit older, hmm, that must have been a little bit less Knights of the Sky, my dear old chap, <laughs> once you got back on the ground. And <laughs> and likewise with things things like this, which you think, oh, that's an incredible thing. And then you think, 
how do they go to the loo? And yes. you end up finding, you know, finding stories and very, very strange YouTube videos. Of which now this is one, as we'll put things. Um, now that we've brought bodily function into this, I suppose yes. we should... <laughs> we, should, we should get serious and wrap it up because this has been fascinating and dear listener i've i have the book open in front of me and i've been sort of flicking through as we've been chatting osprey have done an incredible job it is a beautiful beautiful book the words are fantastic as well let's just oh. throw that in i can thoroughly recommend it your postman will hate you because it, it it does weigh a, a literal ton but the program came to an end in the 90s there's a line in your book where you said that Kelly Johnson thought the Blackbird could probably continue into the 21st century. Mm. You too still going. Yeah. Do you think that was could have been possible with with the right backing for it? I, I, I suppose given the the massive changes that happened around the turn of the, the 90s, um, the, the will for it was was very different. But. Would it have been possible to, to have kept going for another another decade or so? Yeah, um, I honestly believe, um, and having talked to people, you know, that were in the program that went to the Pentagon uh, and were doing all sorts of stuff, you know, Blackwell stuff, who, who knew um, about, I mean, they had developed um, an electro-optical system for the cameras, the uh, advanced synthetic radar aperture uh, radar um, that was used for ground mapping built by Laurel that was digitized so all of that actually could be fed because it was digitized information to a data link and actually when the airplane was chopped and then came back for like two years only to operate in the states uh, because the powers that be didn't want it uh, back but it demonstrated uh, that it, it could do this it could do it all in real time um, and so, yeah, I think it was chopped five years, certainly too early, um, because, again, about a year or so after the program was cancelled and you had um, Gulf War One, one of the SR pilots. I mean, they were all because they were guilty by association of being in the SR program when it was chopped. Most of them were given jobs that were way below their ability level. That's why a lot of them just left and flew, you know, and went to the airlines. But Mac, um, he uh, chose to stay on for a bit. So he flew EF-111s during Gulf War One, and he was using um, that airplane's uh, electronic systems to keep the RF-4s that were gathering the reconnaissance safe. And he said it took so many missions. And he said, you know, not taking it away from the it was RF-4 pilots, they did an amazing job. He said, but we could have done it on our own in one sortie where these guys, you know, it would take eight, nine, ten sorties to get the coverage um, that was, was, was wanted. So, you know, that proved it. But I think the thing was, you you know, between 1947 and 1982, you had 10 chiefs of staff. They were all ex-SAC. From July 82, it was fighter guys from the fighter stables. And, and there was a different, you know, approach. And, and that was the thing, I think. That was the big difference. Which is one of the reasons why the... F one one seven is called the stealth fighter, isn't it? When it's not a fighter, it's never a fighter. <laughs> at all. Yes, it's yeah. Just, you know, it's to keep the powers of be happy. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Crazy old world, isn't it, Matt? <laughs> oh, yeah. Totally, Paul. This has been a delight, and we could keep going, going forever. Because, frankly, every time I, I randomly open a page, I go, "Oh, I want to talk about that." But. <laughs> We we have we have been chatting for a while and I, I, I must keep you in mind. But what's after all this time with you hanging up your, your blackbird hat now, what's your sort of lasting memory of your, your journey with this aircraft and meeting the, the incredible crews and maintainers and designers? Mm -hmm. What's your lasting memory that sort of makes you smile as you look back over the, um, the last 35 years? I mean, photographing the aeroplane when it was on an operational mission. And I went on a training mission some years later in another 135 from Beale. But photo air to air, photo great. But to be honest with you, Matt, it, it's the people. The people that I met because I got in, you know, I 
got involved in this journey uh, have enriched my life. I can say that in all honesty, hand, hand on heart. They really have. They are an amazing bunch of people. Every, every person involved was at the top of their game. They had to be to get into mm. it. And uh, yeah. What a perfect place to leave it. Paul, thank you so much. This has been so much fun. And I, I think I'm going to have to pop up to Duxford just to, just to see her again. Cause it's, Great. Is, I, I now know a lot more about it. <laughs> <laughs> Great idea. I'll see you there, Matt. <laughs> Fantastic. It's a day. I'll buy the teas. Okay. You're, de- you're on. <laughs> yes. Super. Thank you so much, Paul. Great pleasure. Thank you, Matt. I cannot thank Paul enough for joining us here on the Damcasters. And if you're listening to this on the day of release, Paul's book is out today. Day in the UK from Osprey Publishing, and many thanks to them for sending over the review copy, which my postman literally complained about when he handed it over to me because it weighs a ton. There is a lot in there, and it is absolutely beautiful. The the layout and the imagery and the data that's in it. Paul has done a remarkable job putting this all together. So if this is really his last book on the Blackbird, it has been worth the wait. You can grab a copy from our very own bookshop where 10% of every purchase goes to support the pod. If you're in the US and Canada, the book is out in December. So please check all your local good and evil bookshops for that one. I'd just like to say thanks to everybody for their continued support of the pod. New listeners are joining us all the time. So thank you so much for that. Telling your friends is the best way to get this pod spread around, out from the underground and into the mainstream. Who knows? But if you could Give us a review, pop some stars into your podcast app of choice, like and subscribe on YouTube. All of those good things help the algorithms because the algorithms rule the world along with the AIs. And I, for one, welcome our new AI overlords, if they're listening, which they probably are. Of course, if you'd like to support the pod in another way, you can join us and become a Damcasteer on Patreon for just £3 a month plus a bit of that to start with. For just £3 a month, plus a bit of that, you get these episodes early with new intros and outros, and you'll be able to hear our next episode with Colonel George Sonny Holt Jr., U.S. Air Force, retired. He flew on the B-58 Hustler as a bombardier navigator, and we do some myth-busting about why just about everything on the Wikipedia page about the Hustler is wrong. So, until next time, thank you ever so much for your continued support. Do take care of yourselves. Bye-bye. The Damcasters is hosted and produced by Matt Bow and is a Bony Abroad podcast production. To learn more about our podcast and check out our previous episodes, head to www.thedamcasterspod.com.